In the previous slides, we focused on the geographical application of the convention. It requires internationality of a contract. In the following section, we will look at the material application of the convention. Article 4 clearly stipulates it governs only the formation of the contract of sale and the rights and obligations of the seller and the buyer arising from such a contract. Implicitly, it deals with three issues only. Formation, rights, and obligations. It's not concerned with anything else that is not related to contractual formation or parties' rights and obligations. At the same time, the convention clearly states that it is not concerned with a. the validity of the contract or of any of its provisions or of any usage, b. the effect which the contract may have on the property in the goods sold. In some countries, some kinds of contracts may need approval by the authorities to have them valid. Then such a validity issue is not governed by the convention, neither are its provisions or any usage. Here, usage means some firmly established and generally accepted practice or procedure. It's a usual and customary practice in a particular type of business or trade. Trade usage reflects consistent and uniform business practices that are regularly followed in a particular trade. In section B, here property means something to which a person or business has a legal title. It refers to ownership, the exclusive right to possess, enjoy, and dispose of something. In some legal systems, property or ownership passes at a time when the contract is concluded. In some other legal systems, property passes at some later time. For example, at the time when the goods are delivered to the buyer. It was impossible to unify the rules on this point. It's also unnecessary to do so. This convention does not apply to the liability of the seller for death or personal injury caused by the goods to any person. This issue is subject to domestic tort law. There is no mention about e-commerce in the convention. In the 1970s and 1980s, there was no e-commerce like today. Now there are some debates concerning the application of the convention on e-commerce. The convention does not define contract of sale or the term of goods. Basically, goods can be defined as movable, tangible objects, but not all authorities agree. Article 3 of the Convention also excludes contracts for the supply of services or labor, or the contract whose primary component is for the, for the supply of services or labor. If a contract is about the supply of goods and such goods are to be manufactured or produced, it can be governed by the Convention. However, uh, suppose you order the goods and at the same time provide a substantial part of the materials necessary for their manufacture or production. Such a contract is considered to be about the supply of services or labor rather than the goods. Then in this context, the convention is not applicable. For example, Coles orders biscuits from a New Zealand manufacturer. At the same time, Coles provides the essential ingredients like flour, milk powder, and sugar. 
then such a contract is not governed by the convention. Uh, let me give another hypothetical example. It's about the school uniforms. Suppose I order school uniforms from a Chinese factory and provide the cloth and design for the factory, for the manufacturer. Then the contract is not governed by the convention either. If there is a contract in which the major obligation of a party is to provide labor or other services rather than goods, then such a contract is not governed by the convention. For example, the seller sells a machine. At the same time, the seller supervises the installation of the machine in the plant to ensure it meets the working condition. The work of installation, supervision, and maintenance of the machine is much more expensive than the machine itself. However, the contract can be divided into two different parts. One is about the goods, and the other is about services and labor. Then the one about the goods is eligible to be governed by the CISG. Article 2 of the Convention excludes some specific sale of goods. The first one is about consumer sales. It refers to goods bought for personal, family, or household use. However, if the seller at any time before or at the conclusion of the contract didn't know that the goods were bought for the consumer use, then it's eligible to be governed by the convention. In a number of countries, such transactions of consumer sale are subject to various types of national law. They have a specific focus on consumer protection. In addition, most consumer sales are domestic transactions. However, if the goods were purchased by an individual, for a commercial purpose, the sale would be governed by this convention. For example, I buy a large volume of stationery for the use of my corporation from a Chinese manufacturer. Such a contract is eligible to be subject to the convention. Sales by auction and the sales on execution or otherwise by authority of law are also subject to, spe uh, to special domestic laws and therefore excluded by the convention. In some countries, stocks, investment securities, negotiable instruments or money are not considered to be goods. The problems of such sale are quite different from the usual international sale of goods. Ships, vessels, hovercraft, or aircraft generally are not considered to be movables. In many countries, they are also subject to special legislation registration requirements. In many legal systems, electricity is not considered to be goods. Electricity is very special. It has very unique problems. They are quite different from the problems of the usual international sale of goods. Many terms of the convention are interpreted differently in different countries. The convention requires that the interpretation should adhere to three factors, international character, uniformity in its application, and good faith. All of them are quite vague and general, right? What's international character? How to ensure uniformity? What standards should we follow? There is no answer to these questions. 
All parties would claim I'm in good faith in the treaty. In particular, the convention states that the, the interpretation that the interpretation should conform to the general principles. However, in the convention, there is no provision for such general principles at all. When you have a problem in understanding some CISG clauses and would like to check its application in practice, you can refer to the convention database. Another simple way is to type Guide to Convention Article ABC or XYZ in Google. There are also various academic articles on some key issues, but all of these are not authoritative. They are for reference only. The convention has some limitations and has also attracted criticism. First, it's incomplete. But actually, no law is complete. All laws must always be updated and revised. The convention was drafted several decades ago. However, there is no mechanism for updating the provisions and no international panel to resolve interpretation issues. At the same time, it also used a variety of vague standards, such as the international character and good faith we mentioned just now. It also has a lot of compromises to make it acceptable to most of the nations. Its international character gives judges the opportunity to develop diverse meaning. Judges are inclined to interpret the convention using the methods they are familiar with. Some of them may be affected by trading protectionism. Therefore, there are various inconsistent understandings and applications of some articles of the convention. In addition, the convention is in six languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. These are the six official languages of the United Nations. There were also translation errors and some of the terms are very difficult to translate accurately from one language to the other. We can have a look at two cases about the different interpretation of the application of the convention. A Swiss company exported New Zealand muscles to Germany. However, the muscles contained cadmium at a higher level than German standards, according to the German Supreme Court. It's not the duty of the seller to ensure goods meet German public health regulations. This is contrasted with a later decision in Italy. An Italian cheese exporter failed to meet French packaging regulation. And the French court decided it was the duty of the seller to ensure compliance with French regulations. The duties of the seller in the two cases are quite different. 